Okay, so I think we should make a start. Um, just to introduce myself, for those who don't know me, I'm Lawrence Moore, I'm the director of the MRC CSO Social and Public Health Sciences Unit here in the University of Glasgow, which is where uh, Kirsty's a program lead of the Relationships and Health Program. Um, it's amazing to see so many people in the flesh in the same room at the same time, so it's amazing. So really welcome to all the colleagues I haven't seen for so long to be together in the flesh. It's great, great to see you, see you all. And it's also wonderful, and I know Kirsty is particularly pleased that so many of her former kind of um, and continuing uh, collaborators, people who worked with her over the years, people who do so, have made the effort to come and visit today. So it's fantastic to see you here. So welcome to, to Glasgow. It's great to see you here. And of course, it's, it's wonderful on occasions like this that um, friends and family uh, come along too. So it's great to see you guys and the rest of the friends and family. So um, welcome to, 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 to everyone. Um, great to have you here. It's, it's, it's really super, this kind of event, to so have an inaugural for a um, new professor. And one of the things I'm particularly proud about is that in the last six years, we've had six new female professors uh, in the unit. It's a fantastic record. Some, wonderful uh, researchers um, made professor in the unit and also we've appointed two uh, female professors to the unit in the last few years. So we now have eight, eight, eight professors in the unit, so all women, um, there's a few of us men as well. <laughs> um, but that, that's, 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 that's really great and something we're really, really proud of. One thing I need to say before I just introduce Kirsty properly is that um, health and safety, we're not expecting a fire drill. So if the bell goes off, we do need to exit the building. There are a couple of fire exit signs there, but we've been asked to principally use this exit if, if the alarm goes off. It goes across the lobby and there's some stairs opposite with another sort of green sign. And you go down the stairs there and exit out of the building that way. Um, so if the, if the alarm goes off, we will have to go going that way, but hopefully that won't happen. Um, and then we're aiming to, the Kirstie will speak, um, and then take questions, and that'll take about an hour, and then immediately afterwards there'll be some drinks just outside, and then I think at five o'clock then, those who wish to can move on to Curlers on Byers Road um, for, for further celebration. Um, so it's really good to have you here, and we're here obviously to celebrate um, Kirsty's promotion to professor. I'm not sure why Kelvin Hall suggested the venue. I don't know that mean you're going to do a gymnastics display or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got that planned. Yeah. Looking at you, Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say too much about Kirsty's research because I know she's going to tell us all about that herself. Um, but I did just want to say three things. So one is that. Um, so pleased that Kirsty joined us uh, in the unit. I remember a few years ago when Kirsty and Jeremy decided to relocate back to the UK. They were really keen to come to Scotland. We had a couple of conversations about whether you know this was a good place for Kirsty and whether Kirsty was a good fit for us. And I'm so pleased that Kirsty made the decision to, to join us. She's made a fantastic contribution to the unit. It was a bit of a risk for us. It was a bit of a risk for Kirsty to come at that time. But she's really grown and, and, and contributed fantastically to the work we, we do. Um, and that relates to the second thing I wanted to say, leadership. I mean, Kirsty's shown fantastic leadership uh, in the unit, um, picking up the, the programme she joined from Lisa McVeigh when, when Lisa left to Australia. She's done a fantastic job leading the programme and has also led uh, in other ways, and particularly some of the collaborations she's done, particularly NatSAL collaboration, COVID NatSAL work more recently. Um, and also leadership in another area of work, which is the final thing I want to say, is just Kirsty is fantastic fantastically collegiate. Um, she has an awful lot of um, the kind of contributions that universities often don't recognise in the way she they should. Um, so leading the student staff development group, being the engagement champion for the institute, and also currently leading on some work we're doing about culture and values in the unit. A huge contribution as Kirsty has done over and above all the fantastic research uh, you're going to hear about. So that's all from me. So over to Kirsty. Tell us all about yourself and the work. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> so, hello and welcome. Um, what an amazing and slightly terrifying audience. <laughs> I'm looking particularly at my family in the front row. <laughs> Um, it's very exciting to see so many familiar faces, um, and especially after the last couple of years. It's so wonderful to see so many people from SPHSU, 
uh, many for the first time since COVID, and also to see um, some very special people who, you know, have left uh, left uh, left us during the pandemic. Uh, I'm thinking of Helen, Katie, and Hilary over there. Lovely to see you all. Do you know, I couldn't find my very vocals this morning, which means I can either see you or I can see my notes. <laughs> so now that I know roughly where everyone is sitting, I'm going to take my glasses off so I can see my notes. <laughs> Um, so an inaugural lecture is in a category of its own and I thought I should make my own understanding clear so that if it differs from yours, you can get your disappointment in early. I see it as a chance to bring together uh, people to celebrate a, a, a rite of passage. I'll cover some theory, talk about some stuff I've done, the fantastic people I've worked with and the wee career asides that I'll be smiling to myself in my dotage if, if I can remember that they happened. Uh, but Lawrence will be pleased to know that I've set myself two key performance indicators. The first is to raise the odd wry smile, and the second is to give everyone at least one pause for thought on something to do with sexual health. Now, I've had a bit of an IT nightmare, so I'm going to be moving things along on my laptop as well as on this, so just um, bear with me. <laughs> So I'm very honoured to have my best mate from school here. I can see you, Laura. Uh, and we remain great friends today. I tried to find a pic that nicely summed up our friendship, and I found, <laughs> I found this one of us wrestling in a rubber dinghy, which I think does the job very nicely. Uh, I suspect Lorna, if I gave her the mic, would say that other photos are available. You might have to come to the pub later to see them. So when Lorna and I were about 14, we had a burning question and we became quite obsessed. We really wanted to know the answer, but we didn't know how to find out. And the question was, <laughs> how often do people have sex? Over many weeks, we discussed how we could get the answer. Searching in our local library felt, felt way too risky and eventually we decided to ask our parents. And we picked my mum as likely to be the least excruciating encounter. Since mum is in the audience, I won't, I won't reveal what she said. <laughs> but I do remember that she responded as if the question was no big deal, and that was a huge relief. So there's a couple of things about that story. The first is, back in the 80s, it was extremely difficult for a pair of inquisitive teenagers to find out a basic fact about sexual behaviour. There was no internet. Can you imagine, boys? Uh, and actually little in the way of reliable data. And school sex education, for those who remember, was ropey. The second thing is, if I were to go back in time to my 14-year-old self and tell her that one day she'd get paid to find out the answer, <laughs> she'd have been truly gobsmacked. As to how often people have sex, you'll have to sit tight. That's coming later. So first up, a little bit of history. The history of sex in modern Britain is a lecture series in itself, of course, but I only have five minutes. Suffice to say, it's characterized by repression, moralism, hypocrisy, and misogyny. Sorry, I realized I've really lowered the tone now there. Um, since, since the mid 19th century, the traditional authority of religion and moralists in defining acceptable sexual behavior partially gave way to science and in particular to the medical profession. Medicine, like religion, tended to conflate sexual health with sexual morality, but it did at least open the door for the use of scientific methods to study sexual behavior. Several medics of the late 19th and early 20th century are credited as having founded modern sexology, and they have several things in common. They were all men, the clues in the slide, and they all believed that sexual behavior followed natural and universal laws, driven by powerful biological and psychological forces. Although they enabled a discourse of diversity, they were generally obsessed with categorizing normal behavior from abnormal, deviant, and perverted. Deviant, perver deviant behaviors needed to be controlled, and normal behaviors needed to be freed from repression. So their legacy was quite mixed. On a positive note, Havelock Ellis used science to challenge the vilification of masturbation. He and Hirschfeld were also way ahead of their time in arguing that homosexuality was not criminal, immoral, or perverted. On a negative note, their abysmal mansplaining of female sexuality spun decades of erroneous and harmful beliefs about female sexual experience. They viewed se male sexuality as the norm and women as other. With today's perspective, 
we can see that the field was severely lacking in cognitive diversity and also that the social order of the day heavily influenced the assumptions that they brought to their science. So in terms of population research, the biggest enduring legacy is that of Kinsey. He was an entomologist trained to classify and categorize insects. Like the early sexologists, he was a biological essentialist and he sought to create a detailed, value-free taxonomy of sexuality. His surveys of the sexual behaviour um, of 20,000 men and women published in the 1950s provided empirical support to the notion of wide variability in sexual expression. 1950s America, sadly, was not ready to hear about such deviance and Kinsey was vilified. Certainly, his sampling methods lacked scientific rigour but he debunked many myths about sexual behaviour and broke ground for future population surveys. The belief that sex is natural, a, bio, a natural biological urge that needs to be controlled or allowed free reign is still per pervasive today. But there is another way to think about sexuality and that's to recognise it as a product of cultural, social and historical forces. Of course, sex involves physiology and hormones, but the meanings we imbue on sexuality are construed socially and individually and exist in our minds. They shift and change in, resp in response to social mores and technological change. As a simple example, many animals engage in same-sex behaviour, but only humans label this behaviour as gay and make moral judgments about it. A theory I've found helpful in thinking about the ways that social forces drive sexual behaviour is scripting theory. So this suggests that we think and behave in scripted ways, following cues and rehearsed dialogue as a way of organising our sexual behaviour. Our individual scripts shape our interactions with others and are in turn shaped by them. When we interact with a sexual partner, we create a shared script. Both our individual and interpersonal scripts are influenced by the societal scripts, which then dictate acceptable and unacceptable, normal and dysfunctional. And the important point is that our scripts aren't static and we constantly adapt them in minor ways. Understanding that sexuality is socially constructed is key for public health. Among other things, it helps explain how stigma links sexual health and mental health. Rubin talks of a charmed circle to explain how some types of sexual expression are privileged over others. Within the charmed circle, sexual behaviours are normative, socially accepted and legitimised. Anything outside may be sidelined, stigmatised and even violently repressed. The implications on sexual well-being for those outside this charm circle are far-reaching. That was a bit of history. Next up, a quick introduction to the Natsal study. So back in the 1980s, while Lorna and I were vexing over how often people have sex, the HIV pandemic was sweeping across the globe, driven by three intertwined social factors. Fear of the virus, stigma and taboo about sex, and lack of information. Such was the need for data that what had not been previously possible, a mainstream population survey up in Britain, suddenly seemed crucial. There was growing agreement among professionals that, that information was required to help predict and prevent the transmission of HIV. By 1988, there was a proposal for a major survey on the table and funding promised from the UK government. Famously, Margaret Thatcher vetoed the survey, and this is actually her handwritten scrawl on the proposal. She said, and I'm not going to try and impersonate her, <laughs> I think, rightly, people would be deeply offended by questions of this kind, and I do not think we are entitled to invade their privacy. I'm absolutely against this, and neither government nor government money should be involved in any way. When the Sunday Times broke the news that Thatcher had vetoed the survey, there was a public outcry, and eventually the Wellcome Trust stepped in to finance it. On the right is the original Natsal team, Julia Field, Jane Wadsworth, Kay Wellings and Anne Johnson, pictured in the Sunday Telegraph in January 1994. And doesn't Kay look fantastic? 
On the left is the team today, and I'm delighted that in the audience we have one of the founding members of the survey, Kay Wellings. Hi, Kay. <laughs> Uh, we have Pam and Kath, the current uh, principal investigators. We have Ruth and Jessica, who've been long-term members of the team. And I think we have Mary McLeod. Do we have Mary? Hi, Mary. So Mary is a Natsen interviewer, so she's actually done the door knocking and the interviewing of participants. So it's lovely to have you here, Mary. The quotes on the left are really illuminating. I don't, I don't think you can read them, so I'm just going to read them out. Julia Field says, when we started, condom was only just becoming a part of everyday language. And Jane Wadsworth says, we're not concerned with human motivation or pleasure. And it's, they're really interesting quotes, and they give a bit of a sense of how much has changed in the intervening years. Um, it's much easier to talk about these things. So, just finding my slides. So the first survey was published as a book. It was serious, scientific, and famously unsexy. When findings of the first survey were being finalized and published, I was an undergraduate. I was studying human sciences and not really thinking about my future, except naively hoping to make the world a better place by helping people lead healthier lives. <laughs> and at that point, I thought the best way to get everyone into sport, uh, to get everyone to do that, was to get everyone into sport. <laughs> uh, here's, here's the proof. It's my first ever academic publication. So for my MSc dissertation in health promotion, I spent a very happy summer analysing the content of baby glossies to assess the quantity and quality of messages that they had about sport and exercise for young women. As I was finishing up, I met Professor Kay Wellings, and at the time, Kay was publishing papers from the first NatSAL survey and already gearing up for the second. In preparation for that, she was looking for a qualitative researcher to find out how people counted their lifetime sexual partners. And if there is a moment, that's the moment I became a sexual health researcher. So just a little bit on the, a little bit of background to the NatSAL surveys. Uh, there have been three so far, roughly every 10 years. Each has surveyed over 10,000 people, sampled randomly from households. More recent surveys have tested for hormones and STIs, and the NatSAL 4 survey, which we're about to go into the field for, uh, will also collect biosamples and provide for data linkage. So I'm going to tell you four short stories about my research. The first is about my PhD, which aimed to develop a brief measure of sexual function for the third NatSAL survey. To be totally honest, I didn't really know what sexual function was when I got started, but I liked the idea of a PhD with a concrete output that others needed, so I just went for it. So current understanding of sexual function and dysfunction is heavily influenced by the work of Masters and Johnson. They too, too viewed sex as instinctive and biological. After making meticulous physiological measurements on couples in the lab, they devised the human sexual response cycle, which sets out a physiological process for sex, and you may have seen the Netflix series. Their work was radical, but also flawed. Their sample selection was narrow, only heterosexual couples and only women who could orgasm via coitus. In other words, a rather charmed circle of participants. They also only looked at one type of sex. And this is like documenting the physiology of dancing, but only measuring couples doing the rumba. <laughs> and because of the, those sampling and category errors, they assume this universal linear process from desire to arousal. And we and many others have shown that for many people, especially women, desire can be responsive and follows arousal. I'm just gonna pause for a second. Sorry, just need a tissue. So, so the idea of my PhD was to, to build a conceptual framework of sexual function that was not tapped down and medicalized, but built on the priorities and lived experiences of actual people. I interviewed them about their view of good enough sex, deliberately avoiding the term sexual function so as not to direct them down a medical route. So people said stuff like, if I could not have penetrative sex, I'd regard myself as completely useless. I'd be letting her down and it would be unspeakable. 
Why would she stay with me? They said things like, there's a real bond between us. We really love each other. But that's really more the relationship, and the sex is part of that, a very fundamental part. They're just hard to separate. And they said, also said things like, as the sex life diminishes and they've not wanted it, the relationship is on its way out. In analysing their accounts, the biomedical view, the one articulated by Masters and Johnson, was clearly in evidence. But I found people drew on other scripts too. Some adhered to a relational script focusing, focused on intimacy, while others prioritised pleasure. Most individual scripts comprised a mix of these. The implications for treatment of sexual difficulties are clear. If you only measure the biomedical, you may miss things that are actually important to patients. A nurse told me once about how her patients would fill in a standard clinical questionnaire, then turn it over and write their actual problem on the other side. I also found that the relational context was important, and this is entirely missed by most clinical measures. <laughs> of course, sex can be solo, but when problems surface, it's often when there's another person or people involved. And when people experience difficulties, the relational context is crucial in how they cope with them. Specifically, whether the causal attribution implies blame on a partner, whether the partner has fixed or flexible ideas about what counts as good enough sex, and whether both partners are comfortable talking about it. So to cut a long and arduous story short, I use this qualitative analysis and review of existing measures to come up with a new conceptual framework of sexual function. And then after my PhD, I worked with Kay, Jessica and George to turn this into a validated measure that we then used in the NatSal survey. So that was job done on the PhD and this is Kay and I after the Viver having a wee uh, celebratory uh, glass of wine. Now, I'm not saying that my thesis, which was invitingly titled Sexual Function, Conceptual and Measurement Issues, is not a gripping read. But <laughs> if you are interested in this topic, you'd be much better off just reading On Chesnell Beach, which is a novel by Ian McEwan and also a very good film that tells the story of a newlywed couple in, their, in the 60s whose first attempt at marital sex ends in shame and misunderstanding that eventually destroys their relationship. I'm not sure if Karen's here. Karen. <laughs> so while I'm plugging books, I'm going to shamelessly plug Mind the Gap by the brilliant Dr. Karen Gurney, which also debunks many myths about female sexual desire. And she's here um, up in Scotland. It was a great, uh, great um, uh, collision of, of schedules. She's here to promote her book. Um, so Karen got in touch with me back in 2014 when I was still living in Ethiopia, but working on Natsal. She was very interested in the Natsal SF measure that we'd made and whether it could be adapted for clinical use. Like the nurse I mentioned, she found that clinical measures were failing to capture her patient experiences. This measurement failure has important consequences. It makes it difficult for provide service providers to demonstrate that treatment works, and that makes it hard to fight the incessant cuts to services. Guardian journalist Nicola Davies has been a champion of this cause and has worked with us to highlight the issues. So along with others, Karen and I have worked to create a new measure that draws from a clinical version of the NATS LSF. It's brief and we've shown that it can pick up change over therapy sessions and it's now being trialled in a small number of sexual problems clinics across the UK. And a quick shout out to George who's in the audience and is doing a brilliant PhD exploring what sexual function means to trans people. Not a spoiler, but he's finding that the biomedical perspectives are even less helpful in a context where nothing can be assumed about what sex means to people and which body parts are involved. So in contrast to the very underfunded sexual NHS sexual problems clinics, sexual dysfunction has been very lucrative for the pharmaceutical industry. Drugs like Viagra are so-called lifestyle drugs with high profit margins. The pharmaceutical industry has been closely involved in funding research and driving agendas, and in doing so has been accused of the corporate construction of disease. Of course, this isn't exclusive to sexual dysfunction. We see it in other areas of psychiatry. Uh, 
So Lynn Payer coined the term disease mongering to describe the ways in which the pharmaceutical industry broadens definitions of, of disease in such a way as to include the greatest number of people. One of the key tactics of disease mongering is to inflate prevalence estimates. Back in 1999, Lauman and colleagues did a study suggesting that 43% of women and 31% of men have a sexual dysfunction. What they'd actually measured were problems, not, not diagnosable dysfunction, and they didn't ask patients whether they were distressed. But this figure is cited again and again in the US, including in direct-to-consumer advertising of drugs for sexual dysfunction. It's a cynical attempt to, to widen the market and relabel people with transient problems as sick. To counter this a bit, we decided to use the NatSal data to establish what the actual prevalence might look like when you apply standard diagnostic sever severity criteria. And those are that the problem should have been around for at least six months, that symptoms occur often, and that the patient feels distressed. So we actually found this made a huge difference. Uh, in NatSal 3, 13% of men, for instance, said they had trouble getting an erection, and 16% of women said they had difficulty reaching a climax. But after applying all three severity cr criteria, both these dropped to less than 2%. And these seem like much more realistic estimates of the burden of disease. But that is still significant numbers of individuals with severe um, sexual difficulties. As a conservative estimate, it's about 1.8 million adults in the UK, and most of these aren't getting any help. Because of the success of Viagra, the typical market for sexual dysfunction drugs is a middle-aged man. But in fact, sexual problems are experienced across the life course. We used data from the NatsLSF to also demonstrate that young people experience sexual difficulties. The message was simple. About 10% of young people experience distressing sexual problems and just under 10% avoid sex because of sexual difficulties. The message was important because this is such a hidden issue. It's barely been researched, we don't talk about it in sex education, and we don't train health professionals to discuss it with young people. Yet it's a clear, clearly a reality for young people, a part that's hidden under the iceberg. The really sad thing about this is that lots of these difficulties are rooted in confusion, misinformation, and anxieties that are actually quite straightforward to address, and I'll come back to that later. Because this issue is so rarely discussed partly, the media went to town and there was a, a lot of press coverage of this paper. And uh, I even got a live interview on Radio 1 Newsbeat. I was really worried that my boys would find that even more excruciating than my singing in the kitchen, but luckily n none of them listened to Radio 1. <laughs> Which is quite lucky because, uh, honestly, this was the news headline the next day after my interview. <laughs> That's a true story. Uh, hopefully, it's a case of correlation and not causation. <laughs> so, on to the third story, sex and COVID. In the HIV pandemic, unprotected sex was the key mechanism of transmission. Sex involves prolonged close contact with another person, so it can also transmit SARS-CoV-2 virus. But sexual behavior wasn't a key driver of the pandemic because it usually occurs between two people who have often been in close, close contact anyway. Even so, it was interesting that sex was largely absent from the policy discussion on COVID-19 social restrictions. It's completely missing from this list of high-risk activities, despite hugging and handshaking being there. And of course, I've chalked this, chalked this up as yet another example of discomfort about sex within public health. Nonetheless, in the early days of the pandemic, people got to work with advice about how to have sex and avoid COVID. <laughs> in case of any doubt, this was a joke and not uh, serious public health advice. 
And the media again had a field day about sex and COVID. Apart from anything else, it provided a bit of light relief in the constant feed, news feed, about the death toll and unending pandemic-related misery. They talked first about a sex drought and then about a summer of love as people made up for lost time. But did any of this actually happen? And if it did, what are the implications for sexual and reproductive health? And we set up the Natsal COVID study to look into this. So the last two years have been pretty rubbish, but a silver lining work-wise has definitely been the Natsal COVID, which I've been leading with Nigel Field at UCL and with this fantastic group of researchers, many of whom are here and in the unit uh, and with backup support from the rest of the Natsal team. We did survey field work in two waves, four months into the pandemic and then one year later. And both surveys were done just following the two full lockdowns. We sampled 6,500 people each time, aged 18 to 59, using quota sampled online panel run by Ipsos Mori. We used NatSal3 and surve NatSal3 data and su surveillance data as jigsaw pieces to puzzle out whether the trends we saw were observed, uh, the trends that we observed were different to what might be expected. And this is a very high level summary of what we found. We found lower reporting of multiple partners, uh, new partners and new condomless partners. That's very important for STI transmission. We found increased uh, distress or worry about sex. We found fewer pregnancies, uh, which were less likely to be unplanned. We found fewer than expected conceptions and abortions and lower than expected use of STI related services and chlamydia testing. And uh, we were also interested in whether people had less sex uh, during the pandemic, which brings me to that burning question that Lorna and I had. How often do people have sex? So the answer is, in, the, in a four-week period before the pandemic at least, it was three. Uh, and, and then we, saw, we wondered, well, did that change during COVID? Well, there were all sorts of predictions about a possible baby boom because people were just stuck at home with nothing to do. Actually, that turned out not to be the case. Um, apparently, a lot of people were making sourdough. <laughs> not me. <laughs> so our data suggests that the median number of occasions of sex in the past week dropped from three in 2010 to two during the pandemic. It's possible, of course, that the median of two in Natsal COVID is in keeping with a downward trend in the frequency of sex over many decades. Or it could be that the median would have plateaued at three had it not been for the pandemic. And it's something we'll be able to find out when we do Natsal 4. As an interesting ironic twist, the fact that people are having less sex is actually now of growing policy concern. And um, the, there's a national survey in Sweden which, uh, for which the um, decline in sexual behaviour was one of the key um, driving forces. So it's quite a big change from the days in which um, HIV was the, the justification for doing that sort of, uh, sexual behaviour surveys. In both HIV and COVID pandemics, there were stark inequalities in the demand for behaviour change as well as in the burden of ill health. During COVID, rules on social mixing carried heavy and unequal relational costs. It was easier for some to adhere than others simply because the rules acknowledged them. There was, if you like, a charmed COVID circle, or I'm going to call it an oval so I can fit it on the slide. Those in stable life stages, living with their intimate partner or nuclear families, in decent sized houses with access to green space. So unsurprisingly, there was non-compliance. In Natsal COVID, we found that after the first four months, around 10% of the general population reported intimate contact outside their household. But this was 56% in cohabiting relationships and 37% among single people. In follow-up interviews with those who said they'd had sex outside the household during lockdown, participants talked about their need for connection, security, intimacy, and a sense of normality. They balanced the risk of catching COVID-19, social judgment, punishment for rule breaking against other perceived risks, including to their mental health or relationship. And this weighing of risk was often careful and highly rational in their social context. 
In any pandemic, there is a public health morality concerning how to be a responsible citizen. But this morality is contested. I'm sure we've all had conversations in the last two years in which we've disagreed about whether and how uh, the behaviour of others should be judged or morally condemned. Probably, except we can probably all agree that Boris was completely out of order. <laughs> this public health morality was far more fraught during the HIV epidemic because HIV was transmitted primarily by sex and sex, as we've seen, is highly morally charged. In the early days, HIV was said to be God's punishment on the gays. When it became clear that more heterosexuals than gays were becoming infected, this was changed to God's punishment for immorality. Although the proportion of people who believe this is declining, it still hangs around, particularly in conservative countries with poorly controlled HIV pandemics. If you've not already seen it, then I'd totally recommend Channel's 4 series, It's a Sin. This drama was a visceral reminder of the fear, prejudice and moral condemnation surrounding the early years of the HIV AIDS pandemic and of the collective pain uh, suffered by the gay community. And that brings me on to a story about sexual well-being. There's been growing concept, uh, interest in the concept of general well-being in public health, including recognition that mental well-being is much more than the absence of mental ill health. But you've guessed it, sexual dimensions are almost entirely absent from this discussion. This jar of measures of commonly used well-being, um, commonly used well-being measures that include sexuality as a component is currently empty. A study in Belgium has shown that there's no methodological reason for this absence. They found that adding an item on sexual satisfaction to a four-item measure of well-being actually improved the performance of the measure. Again, it seems that the neglect of sexuality might be due to discomfort. But first, let's look at what we mean by sexual health. Kay Wellings has been pioneering in promoting a broader framework of sexual health that goes beyond what she calls the bugs and babies approach. In the textbook that we co-edited with Martine, we talked about four key outcomes, sexually transmitted infections, unplugged pregnancy, sexual violence, and sexual func function and pleasure. This positive framing builds on the World Health Organization definition which came out in 2006. This was revolutionary in acknowledging positive sexuality. And it was revolutionary in suggesting that sexual health was about having pleasurable and safe experiences that were free from coercion and violence. But what it also did was define sexual health as a state of physical, emotional, mental and social well-being in relation to sexuality. And so this has created a bit of a conceptual muddle. What then is sexual well-being and what is sexual health? I don't know whether you have conceptual model drawers like this at home. I know we've got quite a few. So the research field is all over the place. Some use sexual well-being to mean sexual satisfaction, others sexual function, while others use it interchangeably with sexual health. It's a bit of a catch-all phrase for positive sexuality. But this model is holding back efforts to include positive sexuality as a valid and progressive goal of public health. It's also holding back efforts to include sexuality as an everyday dimension of well-being. So one of the most exciting things that I've been involved in recently is a collaboration with Ruth, Dennis and Lucia to try and help move things forward conceptually. We set out four overlapping pillars of public health inquiry in relation to sexuality. Sexual health, sexual justice, sexual pleasure and sexual well-being. Importantly, there are interdependencies across these four pillars. So, for example, it's very difficult to experience sexual pleasure if your rights aren't, sexual rights aren't being met. And each pillar plays a distinctive role in addressing the structural determinants of sexual inequalities. So as a group, and with, together with the NatSAL team, we've been trying to figure out what, it's, what it is that's distinctive about sexual well-being. And a shout out here to Raquel and Karen, who interviewed a wide range of people about this. I can't see Raquel. Is she? Raquel. Uh, so Raquel's now exploring what this means, uh, particularly for young people in her PhD. 
So we did conceptual work and qualitative interviews to understand what sexual well-being might mean to people. And these are the key facets that we identified. Uh, Self-determination, so that's being free to choose or reject sexual partners, behavior, context and timing without pressure, force or obligation. So you could think of a refugee who doesn't have to choose to trade sex for essential provisions or someone living in a country where they can have a same-sex partner without facing prosecution. Resilience, this is about being able to maintain equi equilibrium in response to sexual stress or adversity or trauma. So this might be about being flexible in your sexual repertoires in response to a sexual problem or having a parent you can talk to about sex. Comfort, this one's about being able to talk to a partner, a doctor, your child, without embarrassment or shame. Respect relates to Rubin's charm circle. It's about feeling that others accept your sexual self and preferences. So a young person feeling supported if they come out to their parents. Sexual security might be if you're a student going to a party and not having to worry that your drink will get spiked. Or, or a sex worker, it could be about being free to do your job without being raped or, or uh, by a client or harassed by the police. Forgiveness and closure is about interrupting patterns of self-blame, shame, avoidance, revenge. Most people have some sort of sexual trauma in their past, whether an acrimonious relationship, breakup, or an experience of sexual assault. And being able to process these and find some sort of closure has an influence on current well-being. And finally, self-esteem, about how you see yourself as a sexual being and feeling in control of your thoughts and desires. So a nicely articulated concept is helpful, but to use this idea of public health, we need a measure. So over the last few years, we've worked to design and validate a self-report measure, and this is pretty much what it looks like. We've tried to make it brief, relevant to everyone, regardless of their experience, and potentially able to measure change over time. And all the ideas I showed in the previous slide are reflected here. Our hope is that this kind of work was, will support a move towards a public health agenda which views sexual well-being as a valid goal of public health, along with other aspects of general well-being. It's a bit of an uphill struggle. Public health approaches remain fixated on risk and adverse outcomes, even though the reasons people have sex rarely have anything to do with their health. However, if we can bring sexual well-being onto the agenda, it will help spotlight the structural causes of inequities. And it will also help improve our attempts to control STIs and reduce unplanned pregnancy through a fuller understanding of everyday sexual issues. Importantly, it might help us be better prepared for the next um, sexually transmitted pandemic when it comes. And that leads me to my final story, which is about intervening. So I'm going to ask a bit of audience participation here. Does anybody know what the world's most recognisable brand is? I'm hearing Coca-Cola. Durex. Durex. <laughs> Wish. <laughs> yeah, good one. Um, Microsoft. Microsoft, good guess. McDonald's, McDonald's good guess. Amazon. Amazon. Google, Nike. it's Nike, it's actually Apple, Apple, but all those ones are hovering around the top. So all these brands spend uh, billions on advertising, <laughs> despite the fact that everyone already knows them. Coca-Cola has even taken the trouble to market drinks directly to my sons. <laughs> In fairness, Jonah, I had to talk to yours. <laughs> You're way too unique, even for Coca-Cola. So why do these companies invest so much in marketing? Well, it's because there's always a new generation of customers coming through. And it's the same for sexual health. We need to keep investing in good sex education and health promotion because every year, a new generation of young people has their first sexual experience. Unfortunately, where we have invested, the focus has tended to be on risk. In the 80s and 90s, we scared off young people with the threat of HIV and STIs. In the early noughties, it was teenage pregnancy. These days, we inadvertently create anxiety via well-meaning but unrealistic expectations of verbal, enthusiastic consent. And a shout out here to Jen, Jen, I can just vaguely see you, who's exploring this in her PhD.
so these are important, but we need balance. In 1988, Michelle Fine talked about the missing discourse of desire in sex education. And 30 years later, we've made very little progress. And this is partly because of an un enduring unease with children losing their innocence, which has led young people's sexuality to be framed as problematic and risky by successive generations of adults. These days, there's quite a panic about sexting and porn, but it's worth remembering that moral panics are not new. In the 19th century, there was an almighty panic over masturbation, or the heinous sin of self-pollution, which had frightful consequences, including blindness. In the 1920s, there was a panic about flappers, and these were young, sexually adventurous women who were said to be a danger to themselves and others. I promised Oscar I'd talk about pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> so when you make a pancake, as long as you, I think, as long as you follow Delia, uh, it should all work out fine. There's a defined set of ingredients and a predictable result. As Isaac knows, skateboarding is very tricky and it involves a complicated range of skills. But once you've mastered the skills and you know your terrain, the board responds in predictable ways. Raising owls in captivity, however, is complex. Owls have personalities and they respond to different humans in, uh, to different, humans in different and unpredictable ways. I know there's an owl where Jonah works that gets furious if people wear hats. <laughs> and they, so owls interact with each other, leading to an emergent set of behaviours. And this is something that Jonah's been finding out this year at the National Owl Centre. So promoting sexual health requires complex interventions. These are interventions that have multiple interacting and synergistic components whose effects may vary according to the context in which they're delivered. This means it can be difficult to predict if the intervention will work, and if it does work, it can be difficult to pinpoint why. The first complex intervention I was ever involved in was a community-based trial to assess the impact of improved STI management and behaviour change activities on HIV incidents in, um, in Uganda back in 1999. I haven't actually said anything yet about the 13 years I spent in Uganda, Rwanda and Ethiopia, partly because much of the time I was variously working in the NGO sector or having babies or writing up my PhD or working on NATSAL from a distance. But it was in Africa that I've learned firsthand about complex behaviour change interventions. When we first went out, I joined the MRC programme on AIDS in Uganda, which is an MRC unit a bit like ours, except that we had a football team. The director, Jimmy Whitworth, told, when I arrived, he just told me to take a look around and come back to him with a research idea. And what an amazing opportunity that was. So I looked around and noticed that they were doing a community-based trial without a process evaluation. Even though I had no real training in public health evaluation at that time, I could see it was a gap. So I went back to Jimmy and I said that what I wanted to look at was whether the intervention was being implemented as intended, who was being reached, who was benefiting, who was benefiting most, and why. I actually found out some pretty interesting stuff about the health uh, promotion components of the trial. The community educators, it turned out, were avoiding talking to the people they perceived as more educated than they were. People really loved the plays, but sometimes the key messages they took away were different to the ones that were actually intended. And the information leaflets, though they looked great, sat unread in the corners of houses where people couldn't read. I then also looked at whether and how measuring HIV incidents for the outcome might be affecting the acceptability of the trial. The first complex intervention I ever implemented was the BABA project. Where's Mark? Uh, by this stage, I had moved to the NGO sector and was working for Goal Uganda, an Irish NGO. I worked with Mark and Sue, who also happily moved back to Scotland. Uh, Sue's actually a colleague in MVLS, uh, but couldn't be with us today. Um, but Mark's here in the audience. We set up partnerships with 12 local street children's NGOs. And within each, a small group of young people associated with the NGOs 
were elected by their peers to be trained as peer educators or babas. In local language Luganda, a baba means an older sibling. The babas ran HIV AIDS prevention clubs in their NGOs, but the key mechanism of change in the end was the work they did on street outreach. For the young people living full time on the street, there was little protection from physical and sexual violence. Helping them leave the street immediately reduced their vulnerability to the risk of HIV. There were some positive unintended outcomes too. For instance, this local news coverage of the drama event we held helped challenge stereotypes of street children. The running header says, seeing, seeing these youths perform on the stage, it was difficult to imagine they are street children. I know, that, I know that we also gave a lot of young people some meaning and purpose in life and a way to come together, at least for a time. It was an innovative project and building on intuitively sensible ideas and a reasonable understanding of behaviour change and issues facing street children. But we never had a formal theory about how it, we could bring about change and we didn't have the resources to properly test if it had worked. The first time I actually came across the term complex intervention was when I joined the unit and Lawrence and I led a school-based intervention called STASH. In STASH, fourth-year students, so that's aged 14 to 16, who are nominated as influential by their peers, were recruited and trained as peer supporters. They spread positive sexual health messages to friends in their year group, both via in-person conversation and by sending messages on social media. And they were supported in doing this by weekly uh, trainer-facilitated meetings. The approach was adapted from an anti-smoking intervention called ASSIST. Unlike the BABA project, the peer supporters in STASH were nominated by other students in the year group because research actually shows that these students have more traction with their peers than if they were volunteers or selected by their teachers. And STASH was where I was able to bring together this experiential learning in Africa with more formal academic theory. It was a feasibility trial, which meant we were focused on understanding whether the activities were feasible to implement, acceptable to the students and staff, able to reach um, students across the year group. And we also wanted to understand how change might occur and the contextual factors that would really shape things. Using social media to spread sexual health messages in a school setting had never been done before and also felt quite risky. So we were particularly keen to test that. Uh, we had a lot of fun working with young people to build um, a, a website of shareable resources and one of the more creative things that I've done um, in recent years. So through STASH, I first engaged with social network analysis and a shout out here to Mark, Emily, Srebrenka and Chiara who taught me pretty much everything I know. Uh, this method focuses on connections between people and in health research, it helps us understand how attitudes and behaviours spread across a network. Top left, we were able to look at whether peer supporters had more friendship connections than other students. And then secondly, what proportion of the year the peer supporters could reach in two steps of their network. Thirdly, whether they were connected to other well-connected students in the year group. And on the right, we looked at how peer supporters were distributed within friendship clusters. The peer supporters are orange dots here and the coloured colored blobs are different friendship groups. Clusters are important because they can inhibit spread and it's difficult to approach someone outside your friendship group. So we learned, learned a lot about where the peer supporters were situated and who benefited as a result. You'll be pleased to know this is my final slide. I've been involved in some very cool interventions that I haven't had time to talk about here. Helen, Carolyn and I have been working on, with rape crisis Hi to Catherine, which supports um, on the project Equally Safe, which supports schools to take a whole school approach to preventing gender-based violence, working with staff and students together and currently being rolled out across Scotland. Ruth and Carolyn have been leading the Conundrum Project, working with NHS partners and Scottish Government to get young people meaningfully, meaningfully involved in sexual health promotion services. And then a couple of interventions that I've had nothing to do with, but I think are incredibly important. One is our national resource for relationships and sex education. And some people, I think um, we have some people in the audience who've been involved in this. This is an excellent, comprehensive and sex positive web based resource for Scotland. And we're incredibly lucky to have it. Every so often, the private sector comes along to give us public health people a helping hand. And I do credit the Netflix series Sex Education with that. It gives me great hope. It's honest, funny and unafraid to tackle difficult issues.
And for the young people who missed their sex education because of COVID, I think if they watch this, they'll have a fighting chance. So I've spent quite a bit of this lecture focusing on discomfort, and despite being an optimist, I'm not sure we'll ever get to the stage where we can treat sex as just a usual part of everyday life. But I do know that things change all the time, and even in my short-ish lifetime, we've seen incredible change in breaking down taboos, addressing inequalities, and recognizing diversity. So for now, along with my uh, many other brave souls, I uh, intend to keep plugging away. So I want to um, say a big thank you to Mum, Oscar, and Fred Matemi for all the original artwork in this presentation. And I've just got, um, I th it's quite something to have so many people in the same room that I feel so grateful to. So I hope you'll indulge me with just a few thank yous. Um, I owe a massive debt to Kay. She set me on my feet, inspired me to care about sexual health, taught me how to write a paper, threw me in at the deep end a lot. Uh, to Lawrence, thank you for taking the chance and hiring me for all the opportunities you've laid at my feet ever since and for leading the unit in a way that supports creativity, collaboration and respect. To Lorna, you're the reason I stay vaguely sane and organised. <laughs> thank you for your fantastic support in organising this afternoon. And then the Natsal team. I've grown up with you and you are like family. The unit, the relationships team, you inspire me, challenge me. I love your energy, your enthusiasm, and your compassion. The rest of the unit, there are so many people I admire, I couldn't possibly name names. I don't just mean the people who do amazing research. I mean the people who do the jobs and the volunteer roles that make the unit such a lovely, supportive place to work. I want to thank the wonderful people I get to work with outside of academia, Catherine and Laura at Rape Crisis Scotland, our amazing collaborators on the Conundrum Project, Nikki, Jill, Joe, Yvonne, Karen, and all my lovely clinical colleagues at the BASH Sexual Dysfunction Group. You bring all the colour and the meaning to my research. This is my top team, the Mitchell family. <laughs> Mum, Dad, it's impossible to overstate how much I respect and admire you. Lara, Johnny, your fabulous families, you bring me so much joy and laughter. And my favourite team of all, Jez, my very best pal, thank you for dragging me out to Africa and letting me drag you back to Scotland. <laughs> Thanks for being such a solid supporter of my work. And finally, Jonah, Isaac and Oscar, I'm ridiculously proud of you all. Thanks for helping me feel young and also reminding me that I'm not. <laughs> and that's all, folks, except to say looking forward to seeing you uh, 